Great. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it, if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Lydia, and good morning, everybody. Let's uh, pray and ask for God's help. For you have been born again, says Peter, not of imperishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Father, we need that word this morning to speak into our lives, to touch our hearts and shape our minds and direct our wills. And so we pray that you'd be gracious to us, that you'd speak to us clearly, that we might grasp hold of this imperishable word and hold on to it and let it change us as we live for Christ in this world. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, as Jack said, we're coming to the end of our time in the New Testament letter of 1 Peter. And next week will be the final week of learning from this part of God's word together. And I hope that by now, sort of 10 weeks in out of 11 weeks, that three major concerns of Peter's have begun to get clear. And there's three bullet points on the outline if you want to take notes. The first is the good life, the good life. Not the 1970s sitcom, Google it if you've never seen it, but life lived in the last days. It's a huge theme of the letter. Uh, Fifteen times or so, Peter mentions this good life, doing good. And of course, the good life is not just a life filled with the good things of this world, and it's not simply about doing good things, but the good life in 1 Peter is the Christian life, the life that is built on the good news of Jesus. It's that life that we've been thinking about over the last few weeks, the morally beautiful, visibly distinct, corporately ordered life that we live together as a church community in order to offer to a broken world a glimpse of the good life that is coming in the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but that's one of the reasons this letter has been hard to hear. It's been challenging. Uh, believe it or not, God in his wisdom, has chosen to tie his reputation to us. And so the question arises, how are we doing at that? Are we, are we living the good life? Is our church beautifully countercultural? Is there anything about us that would cause someone to take a second look and ask about Jesus? The theme is probably best expressed. It comes together in that key verse 2, verse 12, uh, which I think is a kind of a, a thesis of the letter. Have a look at it if you've got it open. 2, verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So that's the first theme, the good life. But 2, verse 12 brings us to the second major theme of the letter, which is suffering. 
And I don't think there is a part of the New Testament that deals more comprehensively with this theme than 1 Peter. He dots the letter all the way through with uh, talk of suffering. So right at the beginning, chapter 1, he talked about grief in all kinds of trials. And then right at the end, 5 verse 10, he is still speaking about suffering for a little while. Now, as I think I've said before, uh, some of what Peter says can help us with general suffering. The suffering that we all experience just by virtue of the fact that we are in a broken world. You know, that universal experience of grief and pain and sickness and weakness and deprivation, suffering of broken bodies, broken minds, broken relationships and broken dreams. Peter can help us with that general suffering. But what he clearly has in mind through the letter is the suffering that is peculiar to the people of God. It is the sort of the, the bonus suffering that the Christian gets on top of the suffering of living in a broken world. It's the suffering that comes to you because you are a Christian. And we've learned as we've gone through this letter, and I think this is probably new to some of us, I think it was probably new to me this time around, that it's not necessarily physical violence or state-sponsored persecution that is the suffering at this time, but here in sort of 50, 55 AD, just before that kind of period of uh, Roman uh, persecution happened, there is a low-level social hostility, a marginalization. And again, you can see the evidence of this all the way through the letter, as Christians are branded as dangerous and evil. So 2 verse 12, they are accused of doing wrong. At 3 verse 9, they're insulted. 3 16, they're slandered. And in our passage, verse 14, they're insulted because of the name of Christ. Verse 16, they're suffering shame in the eyes of the world. And 5 verse 9, Peter says, this is going to be normal for all Christians all over the world. And I think that is interesting because it is not true, is it, that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words don't hurt. Actually, what people say about you and what people think about you hurts tremendously, maybe even more than physical suffering. It is the fact that you are unacceptable in the eyes of the world. And as every child who's ever been to school knows, that really hurts. So the good life, first theme. Second theme, suffering. And I want to suggest that when we can hold those two themes together, we have understood Peter's message. Because they don't naturally belong together, do they? When suffering comes, it, it doesn't feel like the good life, does it? It feels like the good life has just fallen off the rails when real suffering comes. It feels like we've gone down the wrong road and we need to some get back on the right road to lead us back to the good life. Is that right? My kind of speaking the way people hear, uh, understand things, yeah? So, or maybe it's just me, but I think that's right, that when suffering comes, it, it doesn't feel like the good life. It feels like the good life has gone wrong. And that's why people talk about their life being shattered, you know, the, the rug being pulled from under them, lies being shaken. And that's why the question, why, always is the first question. Why me? Why has God allowed this to happen? Why this departure from God's plan? And so how we hold those two things together, suffering and the good life, brings us to the third theme. Because the third great theme of this letter is the cross of Christ. See, Peter has no interest, no interest at all in answering our philosophical questions about suffering and evil. What uh, Christopher Ash says in a, in a different context, the armchair questions. Now, he, he's interested in the wheelchair questions. He's interested in real people for whom suffering is a reality at this time. And Peter does not give us philosophical answers. Instead, he takes us over and over again to Christ suffering on the cross, in which we see that God has entered our world and he suffered for us, and he suffered with us. And it's when we grasp that, that we learn not just to cope with suffering, any philosophy can help us to cope with suffering, but to actually rejoice in suffering. And this is what chapter 4, 12 to 19 is about. We're going to see three reasons why Christians must change our thinking about suffering, three reasons why Christians can and must rejoice in suffering. We'll see them on the sheet, first of all, because it follows 
pattern. Have a look at verse 12 again. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Now, one of the great things about reading through the whole letter like this is that we learn to kind of spot little key words. And this word strange in verse 12 uh, should set off some signals in our head. It's a word he's used before to describe the Christian. The Greek word is the word xenos, from which we get the English word xenophobia. Now, that's a useful word next time you're playing Scrabble because it begins with an X. But we use the word in everyday language just to mean racism, don't we? He's xenophobic, he's racist, he's got a fear of foreigners. But Peter has used that word to describe the Christian. We are the xenos, we are the strangers, we are the foreigners. And you'll know that this has been a theme running right through the letter from the very first verse. We are exiles, pilgrims, aliens, foreigners. We are not native to this world because we have been born into the hope of a new world and our home with, is with Christ. So can you see in verse 12, he is giving us a deliberate play on words. He's telling us that if we are strangers in the world, then suffering will not be a strange experience. If we are aliens in the world, then suffering will not be alien to the Christian, but it's native territory. What his readers are experiencing, rejection from families and neighbors, ostracism from the community, harsh treatment in the workplace, hostility, injustice, and abuse, this is their natural native territory. This is what they should expect as Christians. In fact, to expect anything else is is strange. Now, what did this look like? Well, various bits of evidence have come to us from outside the Bible. Um, Around this time, just a few years after Peter, Roman historian Tacitus wrote that Christians throughout the empire are loathed for their abominations. Loathed for their abominations. While another Roman historian, Suetonius, said Christians are a class of people animated by a novel and mischievous superstition. So the intellectual elites are branding Christians as strange and evil and dangerous. It's not just the intellectual elites, it's the man on the street. There is some graffiti that's been uncovered, I think it was in Pompeii, showing a a, a man on a cross with a donkey's head and the little sort of Latin inscription, Alexamenos worships his God. Because these people are stupid to worship a crucified Christ. It's just a joke. It's the subject for graffiti in the street. And Peter says, don't be surprised about this. This is your native territory now because you are an alien in the world. And I think we've said before that this is helpful, isn't it, in understanding our times. There is a kind of a parallel between 20th century, 21st century Britain and 1st century uh, Asia Minor. I turned 50 last year. My wife turned 50 just a few weeks ago. And uh, I guess those of us over 50, just raise your hands. We're in a minority, I think, but a kind of a respectable minority. Yeah, we are, aren't we? We really are a minority. We need to grow that group of people. (laughs) But those people who put their hands up can remember some things that in half a century have have gone for good. Um, I was just trying to remember what what are some of the things. Electric milk floats with endlessly recyclable glass bottles and full fat milk. We were so green in those days, so environmentally friendly, and no one was telling us to do it. Do you remember um, switching on the TV five minutes before you wanted to watch it, to to warm the valves up, Margaret's nodding along, and then having the the dilemma of which of the two channels were you going to watch, BBC One or BBC Two? Do you remember uh, leaving the house <clears throat> always with a two pence in your pocket? It became ten pence later on, but the two pence in your pocket. Now, some of the younger people here are thinking, what, what was that about? It's so you can make a phone call in an emergency, of course, in a phone box, two pence. Um, do you know, when I was a child, one in three people smoked. So go into a workplace, into a staff room, into a train, into a cinema, one in three people were smoking. And here's the thing that is most shocking, the BBC were legally obliged to provide a daily Bible reading for school assemblies. I I went to a bog standard state school and every morning we heard the BBC teach us the Bible. 
And it was my job in year six to switch the radio on. That was my privilege, my little monitor job in year six, switch the radio on to hear the Bible taught us <coughs> by the BBC. And so I think we're looking here less than 50 years ago, less than half a century ago, at the last time it was socially normal and morally acceptable to be a Bible-believing Christian in Britain. Uh, Emma and I went to a, a party uh, <coughs> last night, which is why my, maybe my voice is a little bit hoarse. And um, independently, in the course of two conversations, uh, in which we were kind of explaining the basic Christian gospel, just the traditional Christian gospel, two times independently, we were met with genuine shock and disbelief. Wow, you actually believe that? And in one of my conversations, someone said, I, I didn't honestly know there were people in our society today who had those views. And my point is that the period which ended with our childhood is not normal. That was strange. We are now getting back to normality. We are now getting back to what Peter says we should expect. And if you just glance over at 5 verse 9, which we'll come to next week, Peter is saying, look around the world, and there are going to be millions of Christians like Prem in Kathmandu in fear, under pressure, fear of losing their livelihoods, and worse, being imprisoned, being bankrupted by the state for speaking the gospel. This is business as usual. And so here is the good news. It means that as that culture shifts, we are being given more and more opportunities to learn what it means to belong to Jesus. Because look at verse 13, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now, I don't want to overdo this. There are good things about living in the culture that we have just departed from. 1 Timothy 2, we are to pray for peace so that the gospel can go out. But the other side of it is, when Christians are under pressure, there is joy in the opportunity to learn Christ. So what does he mean in verse 13? You participate in the sufferings of Christ. Well, a number of times in the letter, Peter has referred to the shape or career of Jesus' life in those two polarities of death and resurrection. So if you had to sum up Jesus' career, it's, it's those two things. It's death and resurrection. It's shame and glory. It is injustice and vindication. It is suffering and glory. That's the shape of Jesus' life. And we've seen that in 1 Peter chapter 1, the whole Old Testament looked forward, 1 Peter 1 11, to the sufferings and glories that would follow. He is the stone that was rejected but became the capstone, 2 verse 7. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit, 3.18. And so Peter is saying there is this pattern to Jesus' life that proves that he is God's Messiah. It is suffering and then glory. It is the crucifixion and then the resurrection. And that pattern proves that Jesus has beaten evil and he has beaten suffering forever. It demonstrates, doesn't it, that at the very moment evil thought it had overcome God, God had actually overcome evil. And in verse 13, Peter is saying, if you belong to Christ, that same pattern will shape your life. In fact, that word participate in verse 13, or share in the ESV, is an important Bible word for fellowship. You will fellowship with Christ in your suffering. Well, what does that mean in practice? Well, for a start, it gives you hope in the midst of suffering. If you are connected to Christ, and that was his story, then suffering will not be the end of the story. Victory will be the end of the story, as it was for him. Death, then resurrection. Shame, then honor. Suffering, then glory. And if that is what you know for certain, then you can rejoice now because you know the final outcome. Which is why Peter keeps on using this little phrase, a little while. We're going to see it next week. You are suffering for a little while. The tennis ball has gone up. Christ has ascended. He will return. And in between, there is a little bit of suffering, a little time before it ends. 
But there's more to say than this. We mustn't conclude this is pie in the sky when you die or the Christian life is just a grim, gritting your teeth experience now because it will be worth it in the, in the end. Now look at verse 14. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. In the previous verse, the assurance of glory is something anticipated in the future. But in verse 14, the glory rests on the sufferer here and now by his spirit. Now, what exactly does that mean? It sounds a little bit mysterious, doesn't it? It sounds a little bit mystical. But it's not mysterious, it's not mystical, it's very practical. And I want to just show you this uh, so we can see it. The expression, the spirit resting on you, actually comes from Israel's history. It comes from that experience Israel had of going through the, through the wilderness and God's glory, God's spirit hovered over them, guiding them through the wilderness. And how did God guide them? through the words that God spoke through Moses. And so how does the Spirit of God rest on the New Testament believer? Well, in exactly the same way, by the word of the gospel in which we have put our faith. This is how we came to enter the Christian life. 1 verse 3 and 4, we are born into that experience by the gospel. Um, it's how God shields us through the fiery trials, 1 verse 5 and 6. And it is the imperishable word, 123, 24, which I read at the beginning before I prayed, which has given us new birth and which will see us through to the end. It is as that gospel rests with us, and as we grasp the gospel and keep trusting the hope of God's promises in the midst of suffering, that God rests with us and we know him more deeply. Now, what this means very practically is that while it may feel that God has abandoned us, we know from the word, from the gospel, that he is not. Regardless of how things feel, the word of God objectively tells us that God is with us in our suffering. And as we know that and grasp that and grow in that, we grasp in our knowledge of God. See, Christians don't enjoy suffering. We're not masochists. Suffering is always suffering. It's always unwanted. It's always painful. But in the fire of suffering, we learn Christ. But there is a caveat. It does depend on our attitude. As Jack reminded us from last week's passage, we are to arm ourselves with the same attitude of Christ. We are to choose our attitude. And what that means is that whatever purpose God has in our suffering... It is not automatically gained by the suffering of Christians. It is possible to waste our suffering. And you see this all through the New Testament, that suffering can make Christians stronger, but it can make us fall away. Like those in Jesus' parable who fall away quickly, Mark 4, verse 17, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word. It actually does depend on how we choose to respond to it. And so let me offer a very practical application to this. In your suffering, whose word are you listening to and who are you looking at? In your suffering, whose word are you listening to and who are you looking at? It seems to me that one of the temptations Christian face is to actually turn away from the word of God to other words, to the, the wisdom of the world, the self-help sort of psychobabble of the world or even worse to listen to your own spiraling emotions to listen to the anxiety that's growing in your head and so we switch off the word of god we stop coming to church avoid christian fellowship avoid talking to certain people who are you listening to in your suffering and who are you looking at in your suffering it seems to me that we are tempted always to look inwards or we tend to look at the cause of our suffering. But who is Peter looking at in verse 13? He is looking at Christ and he's listening to Christ's gospel. He has in his mind clearly Jesus bearing the shame and agony of the cross for us. And he's thinking about him 
and the astonishing glory that he will be revealed to, to be. As he does that, he learns Christ. There's a great illustration of this in the book of Daniel. Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are at a low point in their exile in Babylon. And you may remember the famous story when they're thrown into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar for refusing to bow to his statue. Uh, it's like 1 Peter, but in the Babylonian world, with steroids, fire and lions and all those kind of things, but it's the same idea. And Nebuchadnezzar throws them into the fiery furnace, and he pumps up the heat hot enough to melt metal. And in they go to the fire, years' worth of Bible translation, uh, all handwritten, was stolen, never to be seen again. And then her husband of two years was shot, speared rather, leaving her a widow and a single mother in the middle of the Amazon jungle. Can you imagine? And she says, why would God do this? Here is someone trying to do God's work, and God takes it away. All gone, like that. Why would he do that? Well, one of the clearest answers to the question, I think, is right here. And the clue is back in verse 12, in that little word, trial. We might use the word to describe an inconvenience or a painful ordeal. That train trip was a trial. That exam was a trial. Childbirth was a trial. Those things can be painful trials. But in the New Testament, the word specifically means to undergo a test or to prove the authenticity of something. It's the same word here that was used of Jesus being tested by the devil in the wilderness. So the question is, why does God want to test his people? Why does he want to put his people through the trial of fire? Well, the answer is because he wants us to make it to the end and not give up. He wants us to make it to the end and not give up. Let me show you how he does this. Look at verse 15 and 16, first of all. If you suffer... It should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be shamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now, I don't think verse 15 is suggesting that some of Peter's readers are actually in danger of that criminal behavior. I think he's drawing a contrast between two types of suffering with two outcomes. Verse 15 is a reminder that there is suffering in this world that you deserve. There is a suffering that, that comes through sin. And he's not talking about that. He is talking instead, verse 16, of the suffering that is undeserved, that comes as a result of simply belonging to Christ. Now look at verse 16. And there's a little word there that we can easily skim over because we're so used to it. The word Christian. But this is actually the second time in the whole Bible that word has been used. And I think Peter is using it there to emphasize his point. That by definition, a Christian, a disciple of Christ, is going to be someone who suffers. If you follow Christ who was crucified, how can it be different for you? And the fiery trial is there to test us, to expose who we really are and who we are really trusting in. So just glance over to that verse I read in 1, 23, 24 again. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and is this word that was preached to you. See, without suffering, how do I know that I really trust the imperishable word? So when life is straightforward, there may be any number of things that I can lean on for my self-worth, my security, acceptance in the community. I may lean on finance, health, intellectual respectability, career, relationships, or all of the above for my children. How do I know that those things are not idols until they're taken away? Until someone kicks the crutches away and I see that what I'm really leaning on is Christ. Or in Peter's language, when the grass that I'm trusting in is burnt up and I'm left with the gospel. 
But why does this matter? Why do we need to know what we're really trusting in? Well, look at verse 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and sinner? At first sight, it is a surprise, isn't it, to hear the Bible speak about Christian people, the family of God, experiencing the judgment of God. I think this is the curveball for this passage. There's always one in every section of 1 Peter, and this is it. Isn't judgment what Jesus has saved us from? Is Peter saying that the suffering he's been talking about is some kind of punishment or discipline for God's people? But if so, doesn't that contradict verse 15 and verse 16, where the point is that suffering is unjust and undeserved? Well, think about what Peter has already said about the purpose of suffering for the Christian. He's talking about a trial a test, a proof of authenticity. And just glance back with me to 1 verse 7, where I think he says it very, very clearly. He says, These trials have come so that, here's a clear purpose statement, your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The trials are not a judgment for sin. They are the loving blessing of God to strengthen us and to purify our faith so that that faith will endure and stand until the day of judgment. Well, maybe an illustration will help at this point. This has been a picture that has been helping me this week as I've grappled with this passage and I hope it helps you as well. I don't know if uh, you've ever been to the Eden Project in Cornwall. A um, few people probably have, and we went a few years ago. And it's a, it's a visitor attraction about plants. I know that will only excite a handful of people here, but it is a very special place. Um, the site of the Eden Project was, was kind of built into a clay quarry. It's huge. And it's dominated by a series of glass domes. And these glass domes are home to thousands of plants from all over the world. And as you walk through the experience, each dome s simulates a different habitat. And the biggest one, and the best one, is the rainforest. It's the biggest indoor rainforest in the world. And you're actually walking in Cornwall in this tropical rainforest with all the sounds and the smells. And you know, I think there's a few butterflies flying around as well. Now, how do you get a rainforest to grow in the southwest of England? Well, if you have a glass dome big enough and a budget big enough, all you need to do is meticulously recreate and control the exact features of their natural habitat. So you bring in the scientists and the horticulturalists and you get the right soil and you get the right nutrients and the exact amount of heat and light and shade and, of course, the exact amount of rain falling at the right time. And you create these ideal conditions, these biologically, scientifically perfect conditions for the rainforest to survive. And yet, did you know this? That in the early days of the Eden Project, that rainforest failed. The trees withered and died. And the scientists were baffled. The conditions were ideal. They had everything they needed. It was a perfectly controlled environment. What was the missing ingredient? The missing ingredient was wind. It turns out for trees to grow healthy and strong, it is actually not ideal conditions that they need. Most trees can put up with lots of less than ideal conditions. But what trees need is wind to test and strengthen their roots and branches. They need something to build resilience and without wind trees grow weak and sickly and prone to the first disease that comes their way i don't know if you agree with me but i just think that is what peter's saying here that the way god's people are going to survive the judgment is if their faith really is rooted in the gospel 
And the only way their faith is going to be rooted in the gospel is if they have had opportunities to test their faith, to make sure their branches are strong, that they won't snap off when the storm comes. And I think that is the point of 17 and 18. If the fiery trials that are experienced now are hard enough and painful enough, then imagine what it will be like for those who have no roots in God's word, who have not trusted that imperishable sea but have trusted grass. Imagine how terrible it will be when the storm of judgment comes. If these trials that we experience now are painful because God in his kindness is saving us, is rooting us to the gospel, then imagine the, the, the judgment for those who have rejected that gospel or fallen away from it. That is what I think 17 and 18 is saying. And I think this changes the way we look at suffering. See, think of it from the point of view of a parent. Uh, if you are a parent, then you might be prepared to suffer, but you don't want that for your children. But you cannot stop it. And in the course of uh, preparing for the parenting course, Emma and I were reflecting on the fact that all four of our children at one time or another in their school days did experience persecution. Sometimes uh, from children, sometimes from teachers, uh, their peers giving them verbal abuse, sometimes that went on for months. Occasionally a kind of a WhatsApp pylon or Snapchat or equivalent. Uh, sometimes losing friendships. A couple of times real humiliation at the hands of adults for daring to voice a Christian view which was deemed unacceptable. Nothing dramatic, really. They didn't have their hair pulled out or, you know, paint splashed over their front door. Nothing like the kind of penalties that Prem was talking about in Nepal. But it was painful enough so that each time they had to choose. Am I going to bear the shame of the cross and suffer with Christ? Or am I going to walk away from that shame and win the respect of the world? And I think each Christian has to learn that we cannot have it both ways. And as every parent knows, you do anything to prevent this. You know, stop school, bring them in, homeschool them, go to school, thump the person who said it. That was my kind of uh, immediate uh, temptation. Um, you know, put something uh, re really clever and cutting on the WhatsApp group, or, or even if, if you're really serious, write an angry letter to the head teacher. But all of them now, as adults, have said to us that they are glad they went through those times, that they weren't shielded from those times, because those were opportunities to test their strength. They had to decide Am I going to bear the shame of Christ? Or am I going to have the respect of the world? You cannot have both. And so as God brings this kind of verbal suffering, which on the face of it doesn't look like much, actually he, he is lovingly forming our hearts so that we really do learn in the language that Prem used, who is our great allegiance? Is Jesus really the ruler of our hearts? Or are we going to bend and fall over at the judgment? And so, why does God bring suffering to the Christian? Because he loves us. Because he is kind. And because he is so sovereign that even as the persecutors bring the persecution, they are in the hands of a wise and sovereign God who is preparing us for judgment, who is bringing the actual, the relatively gentle training wind of suffering so that we might pass through the fire of God's judgment and be saved. So that's why Christians can rejoice in suffering because it follows a pattern, because it has a purpose. And there's one final reason in the final verse, because it is part of the good life. So I want you to just be honest with yourself for a moment, just really honest. And Jack helped us to think about this a little bit early, didn't he? How do you respond to suffering when it comes? How have you responded this week? I think uh, 
Jack helped us, didn't he, to think about the opportunities for sin that suffering presents, for self-pity, self-entitlement, fear, those kind of things. And I think what suffering does, the great temptation is that we remove ourselves from the good life. I'm having a hard time, so I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to excuse myself from the Christian responsibilities. I'm not going to go to the small group. I'm going to skip church. I'm going to make a quick exit. I'm having a hard time, so I'm, I'm going to slacken off on my prayers, on reading the Bible, speaking the word to others, listening to it myself. I mean, no one actually understands what is going on, and so I'm going to deal with this myself. And we exempt ourselves from the good life. I know this because I do it myself. I want people to serve me. I mustn't spend time with draining people. I'm the one who needs the care. I'm the one who needs you to serve me. And of course, this is very convenient because our culture has given us the language and tools to, to make this legitimate. You know, I mustn't do anything that makes me feel unsafe or uncomfortable. I've got to have some me time. You do you. Look after number one. And so we easily excuse ourselves from the good life because we are having a hard time. And if I'm the only person who does that, then come and speak to me afterwards and uh, tell me that I'm, I'm wrong. But I suspect, I suspect I'm not the only person. In fact, I know I'm not the only person because this is what Peter did when Jesus said in the Gospels, the Son of Man is going to be crucified. And Peter said, this mustn't happen. This isn't going to happen to us. We're on the winning side. And Jesus, in four words, turned Peter's whole view of it on its head, get behind me, Satan. That self-pity, that self-preservation is satanic. But look at it, verse 19. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. I think if you think about it, this verse is very, very challenging and very, very comforting. It is challenging because it is telling us that there is no suffering that can come to us that can exempt us from the good life. Now, please hear me right. I am not for a moment saying there is not a need for self-care, but there is not a need sometimes for healing and recovery, and the most godly thing you can do is, is take yourself out of the heat of battle for a while and to remember that you are human. But you can keep doing good. You can get out of bed, open your mouth, use your hands to serve other people. And even if you can't do those things, you can still pray. And this is the good life. It's good for us. Last week I mentioned Viktor Frankl, the Austrian psychiatrist who observed in a Nazi prison camp where he was a prisoner that people could lose all of their freedoms apart from that one freedom to choose their attitude. Well, he learned something else. He observed that when the weekly bread ration came round, they would have sort of gruel the whole week, and then once a week they'd have a little bit of bread. When that weekly bread ration came down round, most people would just gobble it up because they were so famished. But he noticed a handful of people who took their bread ration and they gave it to someone who they felt was more needy than themselves, someone who really was on death's door. And Viktor Frankl said at the, at the end of it all, when, when everything was over, he realized that it was the people who'd given the bread away that were among the survivors more often than the people who'd received the bread. Now, he's not a Christian. He's a psychiatrist. And if that works psychologically, if doing good is psychologically good for us, which, which it apparently is, then see how more true it is spiritually. Live the good life, and you will learn Christ. Now, how do I know, how can I stand here and make that claim that there is no suffering that can exempt you from the good life? How do I know that? Well, that phrase, do good, it just sounds a bit vague, doesn't it? It sounds like, you know, go and do the washing up and that's fine. But actually, it's the phrase that Luke uses to sum up the ministry of Jesus in Acts 10. He went around doing good. What was the good Jesus did? The good Jesus did was he died on the cross. And so there is a moment when the Son of God, 
was dying. His blood taken away, his breath and dignity taken away. And yet at that moment, as Peter has taught us in chapter 2, he continued to trust himself to God. He continued to do good. He lived the good life right to the end when everything else was taken away. So it's challenging because nothing exempts us from the good life. But it's also inc incredibly comforting because notice here that Peter calls God the faithful creator. It's the only time in the whole Bible uh, God is given that title, faithful creator. Why do we need to remember that God is our faithful creator at times of suffering? Well, it's because he knows what we are made of. He knows that we are made of dust. He knows what it is like in our body and our mind to suffer. And we can therefore trust him with ourselves. See, our human instinct is to protect ourselves, isn't it? To put the barriers up, to select the service we do, to choose the people we talk to, to opt out of those things we find hard because we don't trust God and we need to protect ourselves. But here we need to remember that when we suffer, we are not in the hands of the enemy after all. We're not in the hands of a God who's dropped the ball. We're in the hands of the one who has made us, who knows exactly what we're made of, who knows what we can take and won't push us an inch further, who knows us and has redeemed us. We're sovereignly working to restore us into the image of Christ, and he will welcome us on the day of judgment. In your suffering, you can rest in your creator's hand, the one who actually loves you and values you more than you value yourself. You can trust yourself to him, and you can keep living the good life. So let's have a moment to pray that we will uh, do that. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered for us and suffers with us. We thank you that in our suffering, that you never leave us, but as we grasp hold of your word, we trust your promise, that you come close to us by your spirit and teach us Christ so that we might sink our roots into his gospel, so that we might stand on the last day. And we pray that you'd help us <clears throat> to repent, to walk away from the ways in which we handle suffering that are godless and worldly, and help us instead to turn to Christ and to entrust ourselves to you, our faithful creator, knowing that on the last day we will be overjoyed when we see his glory revealed.